Um, Patrick Henry. How many know the famous statement that he made? What did he say? Give me liberty or give me death. And as I, as I was uh, looking at the passage that God had, had given me this morning, I, uh, I started thinking about that. And I started, uh, as I was going through the passage, I started thinking about Patrick Henry and the statement that he made. But what I want to do this morning is we're going to play a video clip. So go ahead and pull it up and get it ready. And, uh, and, and it's Patrick Henry. Well, it's not really Patrick Henry. Let's not kid ourselves. You're, you're, it's, it is the actor playing Patrick Henry. Amen. And, uh, and he is, uh, he is going he is giving this uh, uh, speech, and um, and so as he is, you got yeah. As soon as you're ready to pull it up, and then when you get it pulled up and it's ready, I'll be quiet. And um, and so uh, this is a a actor doing Patrick Henry's speech. And as I thought about that, I thought, you know, uh, give me liberty or give me death. We need to hear more than just that. Uh, let's look at everything that was going on because he talks about it in his speech and, and, and he, is, he is trying to, to um, educate and, and um, motivate his, his people. The ones that he's, that he's speaking to. And I thought, oh my goodness, you know, this is exactly what's going on uh, in the passage that I'm talking about today uh, that Paul is speaking of. And so if it should happen to come up. Do you guys know how to move it over? Shrink it in the little box. Grab the top of the little box. Slide it over to the screen on your right. And then click big and then click play. That should do you. Now, there you go. Now click full screen. Boom, hit play. And so listen close, guys, to the speech, okay? Are we ready? Go ahead. Gentlemen, there is no longer any ground for hope. If we wish to be free, if we wish to preserve inviolate those inestimable privileges which belong to us as free men. Aye. 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 If we mean not basely to abandon the, the noble struggle in which we have been so long engaged, in which we have pledged ourselves never to abandon until the glorious object of our struggle be obtained, then we must fight. Hey, hey, I repeat it, sir. We must fight. And the, God of and to the God of hosts is all we have left us. Arms, Mr. Henry. What arms? We are weak, They tell us, sir, that we are weak. Unable to cope with so powerful an adversary. But when shall we be stronger? Will it be the next week? Or the next year? Will it be when we are totally disarmed and a British guard shall be stationed in every house? Shall we acquire the means of effectual resistance by lying supinely on our backs, hugging the delusive phantom of hope until our enemy hath bound us hand and foot? Sir, we are not weak if we make a proper use of those means the God of nature hath placed in our power. Three millions of people armed in the holy cause of liberty and in such a country that which we possess are invincible by any force our enemy can send against us. Besides, sir, we shall not fight our battles alone. There is a just God who presides over the destinies of nations, who will raise up friends to fight our battles for us. The battle, sir, is not to the strong alone. It is to the vigilant, the active, the brave. <laughs> 
Besides, sirs, we have no election. Should we be base enough to desire it, it is now already too late to retire from the contest. There is no retreat but in submission and slavery. Our chains are forged, their clanking may be heard upon the plains of Boston. The war is inevitable, and let it come. I repeat it, sir, let it come! Mr. we speak for peace, sir. It is in vain to extenuate the matter. Gentlemen may cry, peace, peace, but there is no peace. The war is actually begun. The next gale that blows from the north shall bring to our ears the clash of resounding arms. Our brethren are already in the field. Why stand we here idle? What is it that they wish? What would they have? Is life so dear, or peace so sweet as to be purchased at the price of chains and slavery? Forbid it, almighty God! I know not what course others may take. But as for me, give me liberty or give me death. Well, sir. Two hours. Two hours, Mr. Henry. <clears throat> How many just got like goosebumps? How did that not apply to us spiritually? I mean, not, we're, not, we're not talking just, just government here. We're talking the spiritual battle. Did, as you were listening to that, were you thinking about uh, uh, being uh, uh, free in Christ and in chains in, in Satan, uh, uh, living for God or, or living for yourself, which then puts you in chains? Uh, I thought when he said, you know, what is it to have uh, life, if, uh, peace, if you don't have life? Peace, listen, everybody's like, let's have peace, let's have peace. And, and the truth is, guys, we're at war. Spiritually speaking, we're at war. What made America great? America held on to God. America chose Jesus as their liberty. What made America great? The Word of God made America great. And we say, well, America is not built on the gospel, but that's not true. Look at every one of our buildings in Washington, D.C. It was so built on the Word of God that it, they engraved it into every building that they built. The Ten Commandments would hang in the walls of the, of the judge, uh, of the courts, in the courtrooms. And we have, we have had liberty for so long that I think what is happening, we have forgotten what it takes to keep it. We have liberty in Christ. And I think we have forgotten what it takes to keep it. As I think about what it takes, I was, God just led me to Galatians. Um, so I just want you to open your Bibles to the book of Galatians. And in the book of Galatians, I want you to turn to chapter 3, verse 26. And I'm, I'm going to try to, to buzz through this, to not bore you, to, uh, uh, and to get through this and get you out of here uh, before dinner. So I think, I think we, may, we may be successful with that. Amen. Um, 
Paul is speaking to the Christians in Galatia, in the church of Galatia to be specific. And so he says here in verse 26, 326, I want you to go to 326. I want you to listen because we're going to read uh, and I, of course I will, I will narrate it as we go through but uh, we're going to try to get to 515 so you get the whole idea of what Paul is, what's going on and what Paul's desire is. In 326 it says, for you are all sons of God through faith in Jesus Christ. And so first Paul establishes why you are a child of God's. You're not a child of God's because you live in America. You're not a child of God because your, your mom was a Christian or your grandma was a Christian or they prayed for you. You're not a child of God because you go to church. You're no more a child of God because you come to church than what your uh, car is a garage because it sits in there overnight. You're a child of God because of your faith in Jesus Christ, verse 26. I love that because Paul says, hey, let me establish the very thing that makes you a child of God. And by the way, if you're not a child of God, you do not go to heaven. See, Paul's establishing all this right up front. Boom, there it is. I love that. Give me liberty or give me death. And what gives us liberty but truth? And so this morning, I'm going to give you truth. And some of you will love me for that. Some of you will be confused of me for that. And some of you will not like me because of that. And you know, I'm okay with all three responses. Because I'm okay in Christ. My, my job as a pastor, and I told you this before guys, is not to come up here and make you feel good so you can go home and go, I spent my time in church and I feel so much refreshed because of that. That's not my job. My job is when you come into these doors to teach you, to equip you, to build you up, to prepare you for life out in the real world. And Paul was doing the same thing here. And so guys, as we look at this about give me liberty or give me death, this is huge because Paul is dealing with the very thing that we're talking about today that, that Patrick Henry spoke of back in the day. So then he goes into 27. For as many of you... Uh, for, uh, for as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. And, and being baptized into Christ doesn't mean that if you were baptized as an infant uh, that, that you're saved because you're not. Oh, that hurt. It's okay. Let's back up. Um, baptized into Christ literally means that you received Jesus as your Savior and then you are baptized in His Holy Spirit in the fact that you are covered in His blood. That's what it means to be baptized in Christ. Not to be, not to be sprinkled when you were an infant and then you're saved. Uh-uh, throw that away. And you go, really? I can't. No, no, no. Listen, this is all about you as an understanding person that, that can process information that you can make a decisive decision for Jesus Christ as your personal Savior because you hear the truth, you believe the truth, and then you receive the truth. That's what makes you a child of God. That's what makes you baptized in Christ. Not the water, but the belief. So then he goes into 28. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And what he's really saying here is, listen, when it comes to salvation, you are all equal. There is not one person in front of the other person. There is not one person more important than the next person. You are all equal in your belief in Christ as a child of God. Because we know there's male and female, amen? Yeah, that doesn't change, right? Uh, we know there's Jew and Greek, amen? We know that that doesn't change, right? And so what's he saying? He's saying in Christ, as a child of God, God looks at you equally. Amen? I love that. 29. <laughs> at this rate, it's going to take us two days to get through it, but we'll still get through it. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham. Now, now listen to this, guys. You, you got to hear this. Because, because as, this is really important for you to understand as Paul progresses through this. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. 
Heirs according to the promise. What promise is that? The promise that God made to Abraham. You will be the father of many nations. And you say, well, what difference does that make? Well, all of a sudden, Paul's going to roll into some allegory here uh, in, in just a short while. And then you're going to see the difference. But this is why Paul sets this up in, in Abraham. Listen, it is in Abraham's seed. It is through the promise. Because why? Well, we'll get to that. Look here in 4.1. Now, I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, does not differ at all from a slave, though he is master of all, but is under guardians and stewards until the time appointed by the Father. What time is that? Oh, that is until the time that God chooses to take us all home. And I don't know about you, but I'm really looking forward to that day. Because the, the, the oppression of what's going on in society really is a downer, amen? So we're not going to focus on that today because we just don't want it to be a downer. Look here, three, four, uh, four three, Galatians. Uh, Even so we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. We had no liberty when we were in bondage, when we were guided by the flesh, by the world, by our, ourselves, by uh, uh, the, the, uh, an ungodly uh, uh, government. That, that's what he was talking about when you were in the flesh uh, uh, under the elements of the world. Look here in 4. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem, to redeem who? Somebody just say me. Me, me right? God sent his son to redeem you and I. God sent his son to redeem me. Why? So that I could have liberty. Freedom. Oh my goodness, God wants us to be free. And by the way, what does he say? Uh, if you are free, uh, you're free indeed. If you're free in Christ. See, Christ is that, that turning point. Listen, everything revolves around Jesus. If you look in Colossians 1.16, I believe it is, all things were made by him and for him. This is all about Jesus. And so when we receive Jesus, when we believe in Jesus, we've been redeemed by Jesus. When we believe in him, on him, then we're free. We have liberty. Liberty. And you know, even as Christians, we abuse that liberty, don't we? Well, I'm forgiven, so I'm going to heaven, so we're going to do what we want. And we make decisions because we know that we're going to be forgiven. We make decisions because we know our Father loves us and that's never going to change. And occasionally, what do we do? We abuse that. We take that for granted. And then we take advantage of God's love. Because we know that His love is going to forgive us of our sin. Now, now it may not forgive us of the consequences, but it does forgive us of the sin. Amen? And so what we have to do is we have to be careful because Paul is setting this up. Paul is establishing this because Paul says, listen, you are children of God and there is no need for you to be in bondage. You are children of God. There is no need for you to be a slave to the world. You are ch children of God. There is no need for you to succumb to the world rather than to God. And yet we still choose many times we choose the law rather than grace. And then wonder why we struggle when we leave God's side or when we leave God's direction. So he says here in 4, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. Who's under the law? Everybody. Everybody is under the law. And because you are sons, or children if you will, God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son. Whose Spirit? Jesus Christ's Spirit. God has sent forth His Spirit to dwell in you and I so that we could continue in our walk in liberty, our walk in freedom, our walk in grace, our walk in love, our walk as children of God. Guys, you realize how powerful that is? 
Oh my goodness, right? Happy Independence Day, amen? I mean, think about what God has done. Think about what God has done for you and what God has done for me. And why do we take it for granted? I think because same reason that uh, most all Americans take freedom for granted. We have forgotten what it took to get the liberty. If only we would back up and remember the cost. I remember when I uh, went to uh, Sturgis one year, in 2004, my brother and I, we rode out to, uh, to Sturgis on the motorcycles. Nice long motorcycle ride. Uh, and it was funny because I was, I, I was praying, Lord, I really want to go to Sturgis and I want to see, like I want to experience Sturgis and all the motorcycles because there's like over a half million motorcycles that, that go there uh, every year. And, and uh, man, different kinds of motorcycles, you name it. I mean, crazy stuff to, to your, just your basic uh, ride along moped. And, and, and I was like, Lord, I, I want to I go there. I want to I want to experience uh, Sturgis, Lord, but I don't want to experience all the junk. I don't want to see because there's a a lot of nudity on the streets, unfortunately, in Sturgis, and and so you walk like this, uh, and you miss everything, right? And uh, and so I was praying, and I said, Lord, I, I don't I, listen. I I know I have the liberty to go there, and I have the freedom to to check it out but but Lord I, I want your I want your hand on me I want your blessing in this so that I see it through your eyes and I see it uh, without seeing all this flesh <laughs> and so we we ride and the ride out there we are in the high 70s to mid 80s all the way out there uh, which on a motorcycle is a great great weather amen and so we get out there and we finally get there and the night we arrive uh, we, well we get there about five o'clock in the evening and we go have dinner and a cold front came in and the highest temperature through the day was 50 degrees with a nice breeze <laughs> what do you do with 50 degrees and a breeze you put clothes on amen Woo! And so all of a sudden I was enjoying Sturgis and I was thanking God. As a matter of fact, uh, he even woke me up about, because I didn't, I didn't prepare for that weather uh, when I took uh, 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 bedding. I had my brother, uh, I said, listen, because he had a buddy of his that drove a truck out there, pulled a trailer. He had a Harley, he was afraid he couldn't, it wouldn't make it, so he trailered it. And um, so anyway... Um, <laughs> <laughs> That's a true story. I'm not even embellishing that one. And so at any rate, my brother threw in the bedding into the trailer so that when we got out there, uh, because his friend was going to sleep in his uh, SUV, and my brother and I put cots up in the trailer, and we slept in the, in the back of the trailer on a campground. And, um, and so my brother brought a, a sleeping bag for me. Uh, the only problem is he brought his daughter's sleeping bag, who was like 10 at the time. <laughs> Nine and uh, and so it came up to about here, <laughs> and the temperature dropped overnight to 28 degrees. And so I'm like, I'm trying to, you know, just like I'm trying to stretch the material. I'm trying to get in there and get warm. And uh, and I'm thinking, whoo, it was cold, and it was so cold I could barely sleep. And then I'd hear my brother over there snoring because he brought a man size uh, uh, sleeping bag. And so I was like, are you kidding me, dude? You're not sleeping long. If I can't sleep, you're not gonna sleep, right? Because you did this to me. And so uh, so he didn't like me through the night because I kept every time I hear him snore, I'd wake him up. I'm like, if I can't sleep, you can't sleep. But then I got to thinking. Lord, you did this for me. Father in heaven, you changed the weather pattern just for me. Now people say, they'll ask me, they'll go, so you really believe God changed the weather so you can enjoy Sturgis? Yes, I believe that without question. Do you know why? Because I asked and I received. And you know why I received? Because I didn't ask against his will. I asked according to his will. God, listen, I want freedom to be here. Freedom to love you, to not have my eyes drawn away from you. God, I want freedom to enjoy this place and all of his beauty without being lured away through the lust of the flesh by looking at naked women that are going up and down the street. That's, that's just what it was. Now, we were there for three days. And so we rode all around and, and um, uh, just, man, enjoyed all of it. Went to Mount Rushmore and uh, went to uh, uh, the chief 
Indian, I can't never remember his name, but we went to that and we went, we just went all over. Enjoyed all the sights. And it never got above 55 degrees through the day. Never got above it. Last night there, we had a good time. Everything was good. It was cold. Man, it was cold. Went back, slept as much as I could sleep. We got up the next morning. We were leaving. And it was chilly when we got up. The sun came up. It went up to 78 degrees as we were rolling out of Sturgis. Whoo! How good was that, right? And people will say, you really believe God did that for you? Yeah. He changed the whole weather just for John Westfall. Yep. I believe it. I, I, there may have been somebody else praying the same thing I'm praying, but I don't know about it, so it's just for me. Why would God do that? Because, listen, I have liberty to enjoy all things, but I want to do it through Christ. And so God made sure that I could do that. Because my heart was pure. My heart was real. And I wasn't stepping out of his will. Guys, I'm telling you, if we live according to God, if we do things God's way, man, God will bless us and God will open the door for us. Why? Because he sent his son to redeem us so that we could be his children so he could give us the things of our heart as long as our heart lines up with his. This is the freedom that we have. Because God establishes those rules and, those, and, and he establishes the freedom and, and he gives to his children. And yet, there are times where we still choose the world over all the goodness of God. Paul says, don't do that. Man, you, listen, listen, you have been bought. You have been purchased. Look here in 7 or 6. And because you are sons or children, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. Look here in 7. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a child. You are a son, a child. And if a child, then an heir of God through Christ. What does God own? What can God change? Including the weather? He took care of his child. And that's what I'm trying to tell you. And that's what Paul is trying to tell them. Listen, you have so much freedom and you have the power of God on your hand. Stop choosing the world. Look here in, in 8. In 8, Paul establishes a real concern. And his real concern is for the Christian. His real concern is for those who say, I love Jesus. But yet they're watching the world way too close. Look here in 8. But then indeed, when you did not know God, you served those which by nature are not God's. Those people who don't know Jesus as their Savior, you're by nature not God's. And according to John chapter 8, you're your, of your father the devil. You're Satan's. I didn't say you were Satan. I said you are Satan's, plural. I know that's settled just as well as the first time I said it. But that's what the Bible says, amen. And so then look here in 9. And I love 9 because 9... Paul makes a statement and then clarifies that statement with a m massive clincher. Check this out, guys. Oh my goodness, this is, this is as sweet as honey. Look here in 9. But now, after you have known God, or rather are known by God. Did you guys get that? There's a big difference. Now that you've known God, or rather known by God. Why? You're his now. You're a child of his. You're in the family. You are adopted. You're heirs and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. That's what it means to be known by God. Because remember, in the days uh, after the rapture and the judgment seat, there will be many who will go to, before the Father and say, but, but I did this and I did this in your name. And what's he going to say? Away from me, you worker of iniquity, for I never knew you. Do you, you see the difference? Paul says you're known by God versus when at the end he's going to say, I never knew you. Well, why did you not know me? I believed in God. He goes, yeah, but you didn't believe in my son, Jesus Christ, who came and died on the cross to redeem you from your own sin, to give you liberty instead of death. That's power. Okay, maybe I'm the only one, but that's, that like jacks me up. You know what I'm saying? That's pretty exciting stuff. Amen? You guys are too Baptist or something here. Holy smoke. Here we go. He goes on. 
But now after you have known God, or rather are known by God, how is it that you turn again to the weak and beggarly elements to which you desire again to be in bondage? Oh. I think of America. And America was great. And then for some reason we've reached a stage where America is desiring to be in bondage. So much so that even the college students are coming out saying socialism's good. Let the government take care of us because we can't take care of ourselves. Let the government make decisions for us because we can't make these decisions. Let the government do whatever they want because we're not able. Well, that's not what the Word of God says. The Word of God says that our Father in heaven who loves us, He gives us liberty. And Paul says, since you have liberty, why is it that you're going back to the world? Why is it that you're going back to the vomit, if you will, according to Psalms or Proverbs? Why? See, guys, we have all this. It's amazing, this freedom that we have. And yet we are willing to exchange it for a few pleasures in the world. Why would we do that? Because sin is fun, amen? And by the way, sin has what? An immediate payoff. Whoo, there's fun and I'm enjoying it and let's live in it. And then one day we got to pay the bill. Because like Visa, the bill comes in the mail. <laughs> and one day we open it up and we go, what did I do? I don't even remember half of this stuff and yet I got to pay for it now. Anybody ever get one of those visa bills? And you start looking over and you're like, honey, go, go down the list. Let's, let's see what this is all about. And they're like, I don't remember that. Do you remember that? I don't remember that. Well, it's on here. Well, let's find out why it's on here. Call it. I don't remember this. And then they start giving you ideas and you go, oh my goodness, I did spend that. A little anxiety starts setting in. I don't have the money. Make the minimum payment. Yes. Because if we don't charge anything else on there and there's only $2,000 on there and we make the minimum payment, we'll have it paid off in 20 years and we'll have liberty again. <laughs> and what do we do? We stay in bondage by choice. There's no willingness to sacrifice and stop buying so that we can save the money to pay off for the things we don't even remember buying. We're just okay to stay in bondage. And that's what we do in our walk is, is we're willing to stay in bondage because, listen, it's so easy to swipe the card, right? Amen? How many, how many just, never mind. <laughs> right? It's, it's like, I don't carry cash, and so I just carry my debit card. Why? Because, well, it's convenient, and I just, and besides that, money is just all germy, so I'm just going to carry my, my credit card, and you know, ooh, I like that, swipe. That looks good, swipe. Let me help you out, swipe. Swipe. And what do we do? Carelessly put ourselves in bondage. We do the exact same thing spiritually speaking. God's going to forgive me, swipe. <laughs> oh, listen, this is one little thing, swipe. Oh, this isn't going to matter. You know, listen, after all, I'm doing this sin to help somebody not to sin. Swipe. Right? And what do we do? We put ourselves in bondage. And Paul asked here in 5.9, How is it that you turn again to the weak and beggarly elements to which you desire again to be in bondage? Look here, 10. You observe days and months and seasons and years. I'm afraid for you, lest I have labored, labored for you in vain. Listen, I'm afraid for you because you're playing too close to sin. You're playing too close to that, 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 that debt that's going to bury you. You're playing too close. And I'm afraid for you because as a child of God, as a church, you should not be doing that. Why are you making these decisions to go back to the weak and beggarly why are you doing this? Paul says, I'm afraid for you. Church of America, I'm afraid for you. Because we make decisions and we're like, woohoo, it's all good. Till the bill comes in the mail. And by the way, even if you move, it still shows up. Somehow they have this way of finding you. God's no different. And Paul says, I'm afraid for you. 
Look here in 13. You know that because of physical infirmity I preached the gospel to you at the first and my trial which was in my flesh you did not despise or reject but you received me as an angel of God even as Christ Jesus. What then was the blessing you enjoyed? For I bear you witness that if possible you would have plucked out your own eyes and given them to me. He's like you love me. You would do anything for me. And then in 16 he goes have I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? All of a sudden there was a turn. All of a sudden, everybody's like, Woo, man, Paul's awesome, Paul's awesome. Yeah, Paul, go, Paul, 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 Paul. And then all of a sudden, they start living in the flesh. And then Paul comes along like the pastor and says, What you're doing is wrong and you need to stop it. And they're like, Who are you to tell me what to do? And all of a sudden, they switch from, I love you, to Paul, I'm going to put you on the cross. Isn't it crazy how we do that? I mean, come on, guys, we've witnessed this, Amen. And so, so that's why I say some of you are not going to like what I have to say today. But listen, they didn't like what Paul had to say. And so I'm in good company with Paul. And, and if you don't like it, well, then you're in good company with those here that Paul's talking to. All right, here we go. Boy, that fell like a rock in a pond. <laughs> look here in 15 or, or 17. They, look, look, here's what he says. And, and guys, I, I want you to think about this just for a minute. Teenagers, think about this for a minute. Those who are getting ready to college, think about this for a minute. Adults, think about this for a minute. Did I cover everyone? I think I have. Think about this for a moment. Look what Paul says. Paul says in 17, they, who are they? They are those of the world. They are those that are ungodly. They are those who, who, who do not like Christians. They are those in the world who think those in the house of God are woo-woo crazy. Look here what he says about them. And you tell me if it's any different today, okay? Look here. In 18 or 17, they zealously court you, but for no good. Yes, they want to exclude you that you may be zealous for them. So they draw you in. They make it look all inviting. And then all of a sudden you get in and they find out you're a Christian. Or they knew you were a Christian drawing you in. And so they draw you in and you're like, yeah, I'm in. I'm a part of it. And then all of a sudden they're like, hey, look, we don't want nothing to do with you because you believe in that Jesus stuff. And you're like, no, 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 no. I, uh, it, was just, it was just a thing I grew up with. No, no, no. I just want to be a part of you, please. And they got you. Because that's what happens. And it, listen, it happens today. It happened back in Paul's day. Right? Give me liberty or give me death. And whatever reason, we always seem to choose death at times. And that's what's going on here. Paul says, look, they have wooed you and they have courted you and they have made sin look so good and they have made their group look so inviting. And then you finally, you get in because you want to be a part of that, that gamma kappa fila, whatever it is. And so now you're in, or you're at school, and you got to be a part of this group. And you finally get in, and then they're like, oh, you believe in Jesus? <laughs> get away. And you're like, oh, I desperately want to be a part of something. And so you throw Jesus to the side to be a part of the group, to be accepted, to be invited in. And so Paul says they court you, and then when you get in, they, they make you feel bad until you cast away your belief. And then they capture you, and you're hooked. And then you start believing lies and you start believing in stuff that you knew was not true last year but for some reason today you believe it's truth. Who twisted you up? Who so easily beset you to the side that made you believe the lies? Who? Who did it? And why is it that your desire was to, to reach and go after the, the, the death instead of hanging on to the liberty? Who drew you away so easily? And why is it that you needed or felt a need to be needed by such an ungodly group that you gave away your liberty in exchange for death? And then Paul says, why do you hate me? Because I've told you the truth. Look here in 18. But it is good to be zealous in a good thing always and not only when I am present with you. He's like, oh, you know, how many people, like, you guys are in a little group? And I know that doesn't happen here, but we'll just say in general, we'll, we'll role play for a second. You guys are in a group and you're like, oh, here comes the pastor. Don't talk that way. Oh, here comes the pastor. That did never happen. Let's get away. Right? 
And that's what Paul says. Listen, when I'm gone, you, you're acting the fool and you're, you're living in your death. And when I show up, you act like, ooh, I'm a good Christian and here's my liberty. Paul's like, why are you doing that? As a matter of fact, Paul goes on and he accuses uh, Peter. When Peter does that, he accuses them of, of uh, putting on the hypocrite. Right? You put on the hypocrite. You put on that mask. And then when I leave, you take it off and you join the party again. How many of us do that? We're one way at home. We're another way out. We're one way in church. We're another way out. We're one way at work. We're another way out. Paul's like, why, why are you doing that? It doesn't make sense to me. Look here in 19. My little children. Paul switches tone here for a second. By the way, I'm never going to get to 515. Paul switches tone for a second. And he goes, children. My little children. Why does he say my? Because he's the one that led them to the Lord. They're his children in Christ. Spiritually speaking. My little children, for whom I labor in birth again until Christ is formed in you. I labor through the pain because my desire is for you to live in Christ and not to die this death but to have liberty. I would like to be present with you now and to change my tone for I have doubts about you. Um, listen, I am questioning, church, I am questioning your salvation. Can you imagine that dagger if I were to come up to you and go, you know, your lifestyle is not exemplary of Christ and so therefore I just kind of do not believe that you were saved. What say you? <laughs> right? I don't know that Paul says that. But Paul's like, your lifestyle is causing me to question your salvation. They have given up their liberty for death. They have been zealous to fit into the world that they sacrificed their peace and their blessing and their promises with God. And some of you in here are doing the exact same thing. And do not think for one minute that God does not know your address to send you a mail, a piece of mail, so when you open it up and you can go, oh, I'm busted. And now I got to pay. Give me liberty or give me death. And you know what? Sometimes somebody may never find out. But God knows. And you just stripped yourself of all the blessing. And all of a sudden you feel empty inside. You feel like your brain isn't working right. Like you can't grab hold of the, the, the scriptures like you used to. You can't process information like you used to. You don't have that peace that you desire. And you go, why, why? And God's like, well, as long as you're still running for the world, you're going to miss what I have for you. And I am not going to give it to you anymore. I was extending grace, and I was extending grace, no more. And you're not going to get any of that back until you turn and come to me. Right? That's harsh, right? But I deserve it. Yeah, yeah, whatever you think, go on. Right? Man, I'm telling you, if parents would be as solid as God is, whew, I know, you're not God, that's our excuse, but you understand what I'm saying. Look here in 21. Paul doesn't leave it there, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wrap it up here in, in uh, uh, 21 through 30 because there's no way I'm going to get 5 through 15, but I will, I will highlight it, okay? In, in 421, Paul goes on. He says, tell me, you who desire to be under the law, uh, do you not hear the law? You who desire to be ungodly, you who desire to do the wrong things, you who desire to walk away from God rather than walk in, in, the, in the footsteps of God, you who desire to have your, your own identity rather than the identity of Christ, you who desire to choose death over liberty. That's what he says. I know it's, you didn't see all that in there, but it's there. Tell me, you who desire to be under the law, do you not hear the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons. Now this is allegory. Uh, this, is just, this is just Paul uh, uh, getting his point across, okay? And so, so as you look at this, um, don't think that, well, let's move on. It's allegory. And if you don't know what that means, uh, uh, say, okay, Google, or hey, Siri. And they'll give you the definition. All right, here we go. Verse 22, for it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bond, sir, a bond woman, the other by a free woman. But he who was of the bond woman was born according to the flesh, and of the flesh, or of the free woman through promise. So what, what he's making, uh, what Paul's making very clear here, 
But it's, listen, if you came from Isaac, then you have the promise of God. And with the promise of God comes life. And with the promise of God comes blessing. With the promise of God uh, comes all this stuff that God gives because he promises to give. It's called liberty. If you are born of the, of the child of, of the flesh, who is that? Who is it? Nobody wants to jump out there at Ishmael? Look here. In 2024, 20, uh, which things are symbolic? For these are the two covenants, the one from Mount Sinai, which gives birth to bondage, which is from Hagar. And remember when Moses went up on Mount Sinai, what did he get? He got the law. This is how you are to live. Dun, 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 dun. Rigid. Boom. Rigid. Uh, so rigid that if you violated it, what happened? The earth would open up and pull you in. If you touched the ark, you were struck, struck dead. God's like, rigid. Rigid. Boy, if he were that rigid today, how uh, much more obedient would we be? Anybody often think of that? We'd be like, give me liberty, give me liberty. I'm walking in liberty, I want liberty, I want liberty. Uh, somebody comes up and says, hey, look over here, man. And they try to tempt you and you're like, liberty, 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 liberty. I mean, we would not stray away if God was as stringent today as he was back then. Amen? Okay, maybe, maybe you would, but I'm thinking that I wouldn't. Uh, I'm just going, okay, Lord, I got it. Uh, of course, I am a little slow, so I may have missed the first turn, but you know, not survived it. I don't know. Look here in 24, uh, which things are symbolic for these are the two covenants, the one from Mount Sinai, which gives birth to bondage, which is Hagar. For this, Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to Jerusalem, which now is and is in bondage with her children. But the Jerusalem above is free. Why? Because they're living in the promise of Abraham, which is the mother of us all. For it is written, uh, rejoice, O barren, you who do not bear, break forth and shout, you who are not in labor. For the desolate has many more children than she who has a husband. And so, listen, what he's talking about, and, and he goes on in 28, Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, our children of promise, but he who was born according to the flesh then persecuted him who was born according to the Spirit. Even so, it is now. And so Paul says, listen, even back then that, that those of the flesh persecuted those of the Spirit, it's going to happen again today. But listen, if you're born of the Spirit, you have liberty. If you're born of the Spirit, you have God on your side. If you're born of the Spirit, then listen, you have all the promises of God plus your heirs and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. What a greater promise to have. But if you choose to live in the flesh, you will pay the price of the flesh. So he goes on. 29 or 30. Nevertheless, what does the scripture say? Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. Verse 5, 1. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free, and do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. So here's what happens. Paul lays it all out. Paul lets you know the difference between liberty and death. Paul lets you know why you have liberty and he lets you know why you have death. Paul also lets you know that, listen, the world is going to try to pull you in. They're going to try and draw you in for one reason, give you death. That's it. There's, there's no other reason. And listen, how many here see Christianity trying to be stopped in the world? I mean, if you don't see it, you are blind. Because look at the schools. Take, take, take the Bible out of school. Take prayer out of school. Take the Bible out of school. Uh, don't you say the name Jesus, you're gone. You wear a t-shirt that says Jesus on it, you're suspended. But yet you can wear a shirt that says abortion rules, and that's okay. You can wear a shirt that says, uh, um, I hate Christians, and that's okay. You can, listen, you can do whatever you want against a Christian, and it's okay. But you do anything uh, uh, to support Christianity, and you're gone. Do you not see this today? Listen, I'm telling you, the Christian is being crucified today in many, many ways. Paul says, listen, Paul says that is going to happen. And, and you, listen, some of you are, are you're, you're, okay, I get it, your home life isn't that good. And you're struggling. For whatever reason it is, you're struggling. And maybe it's just because uh, uh, you're not seeing things right, or maybe you are, I don't, I don't even know. But here's what I do know. 
When you start feeling insecure and you start struggling and you think your home life is horrible and you go out and, and you try to find a group that you can be a part of, look at what that group's doing. If the name of Jesus never comes up, you're in the wrong group. If church is not mentioned, you're in the wrong group. If grace is not mentioned, you're in the wrong group. If you're, where prayer is not mentioned, you're in the wrong group. And you're like, but I want to be accepted. You are accepted. Satan would love to have you. But God wants you more because he sent his son to die for you. Who does Satan send to die for you? Nobody. He just requires your life. Give me liberty or give me death. When you think of Patrick Henry's speech, when I think of it, when I hear it, I can't help but to equate it with the battle, the spiritual battle that's going on today. Satan wants to take you down and he doesn't care how he does it. And you know the truth is, we say, give me liberty or give me death. And then we got a battle and we run from the battle. You know what you chose? You chose death. Unfortunately, it does require war to obtain peace sometimes. Spiritually speaking, the battle is great for you to obtain peace in this world. God says, here it is, I give it to you. And it's yours as long as you stand in my presence and you hold my hand and you walk with me. But when you leave and you go out into the world where, where I'm not going to protect you out there because it's your choice and so you, you're just going to have to pay that price. And you go, God wouldn't do that to me. No, God will do that to you. It's a matter of time. It's just a matter of time, guys. You cannot live in your sin and God continually let it go. As a matter of fact, we see in Romans where he says, I'll give you over to your reprobate mind. You want, you want to live in your sin? Then you're going to die in it too. And we go, oh, God wouldn't do that. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that shall he also reap. When you think of give me liberty or death, we could talk about our country all day long. But I want you to think about you and your walk with God. I want you to think about your liberty and your death, spiritually speaking. And don't think for one minute that you're going to get away with it any more than America has gotten away with it. America has chosen death lately. And we see it all over. Do not think that you will be the exception to the rule. For God is not mocked. You want liberty? You hold on to Jesus. You want death? Simply let go. When every head bowed, every eye closed. As you're here today, and I'm really glad you're here, and I wasn't trying to paint a downer, but man, when I think about liberty and death, and I think about Independence Day, I have to think about us spiritually. We need to pray for our country, but, but the truth of the matter is, if the Christian doesn't choose liberty and take a stand and fight, what chance does our country have? Give me liberty or death starts with you as an individual in your heart. And you can allow the world to sweep you away. You can allow sinful decisions to sweep you away. You can allow decisions of the flesh to sweep you away. Or you can stand firm. Be Christ-like. And have victory. And maybe change your friend 
share the gospel, they hear about Jesus, they get saved, their life has changed, or your coworker, or your family. Give me liberty or give me death always, always begins with the individual in his heart and his attitude toward God. Always. If you're here today and you do not have liberty because you don't know Jesus as your Savior, I want to give you an opportunity to change that. And so if you're here today and uh, uh, you desire to have liberty, you desire to follow God, you desire to let go of the world and to hold on to Him knowing that that is your only hope and your only freedom is in Christ, then you pray this prayer. The words are not going to save you. Um, the words are just kind of a road map to guide you through the process. I was sharing with an 11 year old girl the other day. Uh, I was sharing the gospel and, and um, she picked up one of our tracks and she read it and she, and she said, uh, uh, what does sincerely mean? And I said, sincerely means that, that you mean it. It's real to you. It's not just words. It's real. And she said, you mean um, like saying I'm sorry when I'm not really sorry versus saying I'm sorry when I'm really sorry. I said, exactly. And if you're going to say I'm sorry to God, forgive me, it's got to be like you're really sorry and you really want forgiveness. If not, don't, don't pray this prayer. Don't, don't set yourself up uh, with, a, with a fake false start um, only to be condemned in the end. You have to mean this. God knows your heart. And he knows if you're playing games or if you're not. And he knows if you're sincere or if you're not sincere. And so if you're not sincere, uh, don't, don't kid yourself because you're not going to kid God. You pray this prayer quietly to yourself. Dear Lord Jesus, today I choose liberty. Today I stop walking in death. Today I believe Jesus Christ died on the cross for my sins. Today I ask for forgiveness of all those sins. Today, I repent. I stop walking in the direction of the world and I turn and walk in your direction. Today, I surrender my life to you. Every head bowed, every eye closed. If you're here today, and for the first time, now listen, if you have prayed this in the past and you meant it, you don't have to pray it again. You're, you're, you're saved. You're going to heaven. You're a child of God. You're heirs and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. But if you prayed it today for the first time and you meant it today for the first time, you may have prayed it a hundred times before, but you meant it today. If that's you, you ask Jesus to be your Savior today for the first time. Would you just raise your hand so I can rejoice with you? Today I gave my life to Christ. Anyone in here? Today I asked for liberty. Amen. Anyone else? Today I asked for liberty. If you're here and you say, you know, Pastor... Man, I've been choosing the death trail for a long time and it's time that I stop that and I start choosing to hold the hand of Christ. It's time that I change my direction and start living for the Lord. Will you pray for me? If that's you, will you just raise your hand? Today, I want to walk with Christ. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for the day. I thank you for your word. Father, I thank you that Paul was so poignant in his writing. He didn't sway to the left or to the right. He just made his statements knowing that they lined up with your word because all scripture is given by you. And he was obedient to pen that. Father, may we be obedient to walk in you, in Christ. May we choose liberty 
and all the costs that come with that choice rather than choose death which truly is the easy way to go. May we choose liberty to glorify you to have your hand upon our life to walk in victory rather than march in defeat. Father, as we go today and we think of Independence Day, we think of July 4th and all it means to us as, as a country. Father, help us to realize the only reason that we have that as a country is because men and women of old decided to die for you. To take that stand in you. To have liberty in you. And Father, if we want our country to continue to be free, we too must decide to die in you. To make those decisions that are hard, that may even cost us our life, but they'll give the next generation their life. Father, help us to understand that liberty and death begins with each and every one of us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We at Connecting Point Church are excited to have you join us. When you come, you'll experience a friendly, lively, and casual family-like atmosphere that welcomes you as you are. Our messages combine straightforward biblical truths, humor, and life-changing challenges for you to learn and grow in God's Word. We believe in connecting people to Christ, to the plans and gifts He has for them, and with people in our community who share these values. We also believe in reaching out to our local area and the regions beyond. We're dedicated to being a place where your entire family can believe, belong, and become all that God intends you to be. Discover the abundance of life in Jesus Christ as you begin to understand the roots of the problems and learn to apply the tools for you to triumph over your challenges today. It'll be a breath of fresh air in this unsettled world.